Chapter 6 The Flying Coffin As Japanese planes dove over Oahu, that's where I'm reading this book from right now, the island of Oahu in Hawaii. More than 2,000 miles to the west, a few marines were sitting in a mess hall on Wake Atoll having breakfast. I've never been to Wake Atoll. Apparently it's 2,000 miles to the west. I'll stop interrupting. Extremely small, lacking its own water supply, Wake would have been a useless atoll, but for one enormous attribute, it lay far out in the Pacific, making it a strategically ideal spot for an air base, and so it was home to one runway and about 500 bored American servicemen, mostly Marines. Aside from the occasional refueling stopovers of Pan American World Airway planes, nothing interesting ever happened there. But that December morning, just as the Marines were starting on their pancakes, an air raid siren began wailing. By noon, the sky was streaked with Japanese bombers, buildings were exploding, and a few startled men on less than three square miles of coral find themselves on the front of the Second World War. All over the Pacific that morning, the story was the same. In less than two hours over Pearl Harbor, Japan badly wounded the American Navy and killed more than 2,400 people. Almost simultaneously, it attacked Thailand, Shanghai, Malaya, the Philippines, Guam, Midway, and Wake. In one day of breathtaking violence, a new Japanese onslaught had begun. In America, invasion was expected at any moment. Less than an hour after the Japanese bombed Hawaii, mines were being laid in San Francisco Bay. In Washington, Civil Defense Minister Fiorello LaGuardia looped around the city in a police car, sirens blaring, shouting the word, Come! into a loudspeaker. At the White House, Eleanor Roosevelt dashed off a letter to her daughter, Anna, urging her to get off their children off the West Coast. A butler overheard the president speculating on what he'd do if Japanese forces advanced as far as Chicago. Meanwhile, just up Massachusetts Avenue, smoke billowed from the grounds of the Japanese embassy where Jimmy Sasaki worked. Staffers were burning documents in the embassy yard. On the sidewalks, a crowd watched in silence. On the night of December 7th through 8th, there were four air raid alerts in San Francisco. At Shepherd Field Air Corps School in Texas, spooked officers ran through the barracks at 4 a.m. screaming that Japanese planes were coming and ordering the cadets to sprint outside and throw themselves on the ground. In coming days, trenches were dug along the California coast and schools in Oakland were closed. From New Jersey to Alaska, reservoirs, bridges, tunnels, factories, and waterfronts were being put on guard. In Kearney, Nebraska, citizens were instructed on disabling incendiary, incendiary bombs with garden hoses. Blackout curtains were hung in windows across America, from solitary farmhouses to the White House. Shocking rumors circulated. Kansas City was about to be attacked. San Francisco was being bombed. The Japanese had captured the Panama Canal. Japan galloped over the globe. On December 10th, it invaded the Philippines and seized Guam. The next day, it invaded Burma. A few days later, British Borneo, Hong Kong fell on Christmas. North Borneo, Rabul, Manila, and the U.S. base in the Philippines fell in January. The British were driven from Malaya and into surrender into Singapore in 70 days. There was one snag, Wake, surely expected to be an easy conquest, wouldn't give in. For three days, the Japanese bombed and staffed the atoll. On December 11th, a vast force, including 11 destroyers and light cruisers, launched an invasion attempt. The little group of defenders shoved them back, sinking two destroyers and damaging nine other ships, shooting down two bombers and forcing the Japs to abort their first loss of the war. It wasn't until December 23rd that the Japanese finally seized Wake and captured the men on it. To the Americans, 52 military deaths and an estimated 1,153 Japanese have been killed. Wow. For several days, the captives were held on the airfield, shivering by night, sweltering by day, singing Christmas carols to cheer themselves. They were initially slated for execution, but after a Japanese officer's intervention, most were crowded into the holds of the ship and sent to Japan and occupied China as some of the first Americans to become POWs under the Japanese. Unbeknownst to America, 98 captives were kept on wake. The Japanese were going to enslave them. Wow. <clears throat> the Louis had been miserable over having to rejoin the Air Corps. It wasn't so bad after all. Training at Texas's Ellington Field, then Midland Army Flying School, 
He earned superb test scores. The flying was usually straight and level, so air sickness wasn't a problem. Best of all, women found the flyboy uniform irresistible. While Louis was out walking one afternoon, a convertible fringed in blondes pulled up and he was scooped up into the car and sped off to a party. When it happened a second time, he sensed a positive trend. Lou was trained in the, the use of two bomb sites. At that time, the military was experimenting with dive bombing tactics for heavy bombers. For dive bombing training, he had $1 handheld slight consisting of aluminum plate with a peg in the dangling weight. For flat runs, he had the Norden bomb sight, an extremely sophisticated analog computer that, at $8,000, cost more than twice the price of the average American home. On a bombing run with the Norden sight, Louis would visually locate the target, make calculations, and feed information on air, speed, altitude, wind, and other factors into the device. The bomb sight would then take over flying a plane, follow a precise path to the target, calculate the drop angle, and release the bombs at the optimal moment. Once the bombs were gone, Louis would yell, Bombs away! and the pilot would take control again. Northern bomb sites were so secret that they were stored in guarded vaults and moved under armed escort, and the men were forbidden, forbidden to photograph or write about them. If his plane was going down, Louis was under orders to fire his Colt 45 into the bomb site to prevent it from falling into enemy hands, then see about saving himself. In August 1942, Louis graduated from Midland, was a commissioned second lieutenant. He jumped into a French Cadillac. and drove to California to say goodbye to his family before heading into his final round of training, then war. Pete was now a Navy Chief Petty Officer stationed in San Diego, came home to see Louis off. On the afternoon of August 19th, the Zamperinis gathered on the front steps for a last photograph. Louis and Pete, dashing in their dress uniforms, stood on the bottom step with their mother between them, tiny beside her sons. Louise was on the verge of tears. The August sun was sharp on her face, and she and Louis squinted hard and looked slightly away from the camera as if it all before them was lost in the glare. Louis and his father rode together to the train station. The platform was crowded with uniformed young men and crying parents clinging to one another, saying goodbye. When Louis embraced his father, he could feel him shaking. As his train pulled away, Louis looked out the window. His father stood with his hand in the air, a wavering smile on his face. Louis wondered if he'd ever see him again. The train carried him to a perpetual dust storm known as Ephrata, Washington, where there was an air base in the middle of a dry lake bed. The lake bed was on a mission to bury the base, the men, and all of their planes, and it was succeeding. The air was so clouded with blowing dirt that the men waded through drifts a foot and a half deep. Clothes left out of the duffel bag were instantly filthy, and all the meals which the crews ate outside while sitting on the ground were infused with sand. The ground crews, which had to replace 24 dirt-clogged aircraft engines in 21 days, resorted to spraying oil on the taxiways to keep the dust down. Getting the lake bed off the men was problematic. The hot water ran out long before the men did, and because the PX didn't sell shaving soap, practically everyone had a brain had a brambly dust-catching beard. A brambly dust-catching beard. A brambly dust-catching beard. <clears throat> Not long after his arrival, Louis was standing at the base, sweating and despairing over the landscape, when a square second lieutenant walked up and introduced himself. He was Russell Allen Phillips, and he would be Louis's pilot. Born in Greencastle, Indiana in 1916, Phillips had just turned 26. He had grown up in a profoundly religious home in La Porte, Indiana, where his father had been a Methodist pastor. As a boy, he'd been so quiet that adults must have thought him timid, but he had a secret bold stripe. He snuck around the neighborhood with bags full of flour, launching guerrilla attacks on windshields of passing cars. In one Memorial Day weekend, he weds himself into a car trunk to sneak into the infield of the Indy 500. He had gone to the Purdue University, where he earned a degree in forestry and conservation. In ROTC, his captain had called him the most unfit, lousy-looking soldier he'd ever seen. Ignoring the captain's assessment, Philip had enlisted in the Air Corps, where he had proven to be a born airman. At home, they called him Alan. In the Air Corps, they called him Phillips. The first thing people tended to notice about Phillips was that they hadn't noticed him earlier. He was so recessive that he could be in a room for a long time before anyone realized he was there. He was smallish, short-legged. Some of the men called him Sandblaster because... Said one pilot, his fanny was so close to the ground. 
For unknown reasons, he wore one pant leg much shorter than the other. He had a tidy, huh, he had a tidy, pleasant, boyish face that tended to blend with the scenery. This probably contributed to his invisibility, but what really did it was his silence. Phillips was an amiable man and was, judging by his letters, highly articulate, but he preferred not to speak. You could park him in a crowd of chattering party donors, and he'd emerge at evening's end having never said a word. People had long conversations with him, only to realize later that he hadn't spoken. If he had a boiling point, he never reached it. He, ro he rolled along with every inexplicable order from his supervisors, every foolish act of his inferiors, and every abrasive personality that military life could throw at an officer. He dealt with every manner of adversity with calm, adaptive acceptance. In a crisis, Louis would learn, Philip's veins ran ice water. This Phillips guy seems pretty cool. Phillips had one consuming passion. When he had entered college, his father had taken a new pastorship in Terry Haunt. There, Phillips' sister had introduced him to a girl from the church choir, a college student named Cecile Perry, known as Cecy. She had auburn hair, a curvy figure, a boy in disposition, a quick mind, and a family cat named Chopper. She was studying to be a teacher. At a prom in Terry Haunt, Alan kissed Cecy. He was a goner, and so was she. On a Saturday night in November 1941, when he left for the Air Corps, Phillips spent five last minutes with CC at the Indi Indianapolis train station. When the fighting was over, he promised he'd make her his bride. He kept her photo on his footlocker and wrote her love letter several times a week. When she turned 21, he sent his pay and asked to find an engagement ring. Alan's ring was soon on CeCe's finger. In June 1942, just after her graduation, CeCe traveled to Phoenix to see Alan get his wings. Crazy in love, the two talked about running off to get hitched right then, but reconsidered, deciding to marry at the next training venue and live together there until he was deployed. That venue was in Infrada, and when Phillips saw it, he kicked himself. I wished a hundred times that he had gotten married when we were in Phoenix, he wrote to her, but I wouldn't let, ask you to come out here and live in a dump like Infrada. Again, they postponed their wedding. In the fall, Alan's training would be finished. Then they hoped that they would have one more chance to see each other before he went to war. In Afrata, Louis and Phillips felt in together. Phillips floated along contentedly in Louis's chatty bombing. Louis liked Phillips' quiet steadiness and thought him the kindest person he ever met. They never had a single argument and was almost never apart. Phillips called Louis his amp. Louis called Phillips Phil. Man, I hope this Phillips guy doesn't die and never see his bride. The rest of Phillips' bomber crew assembled, serving as engineer and top turning gunner would be 22-year-old Stanley Pillsbury, who'd been running his family's main farm before joining up. The other engineer was Virginia native Clarence Douglas, who would operate one of the two side-directed waste guns behind the wings. The navigator and nose gunner would be Robert Mitchell, professor's son from Illinois. Tiny Frank Glassman, with his tightly curled hair, was a dead ringer for Harpo Marx. He would be their radio man and, later, him, their belly gunner. Because Frank hailed from Chicago, the men called him gangsta. Ray Lambert of Maryland would man the tail gun. The crew's girl magnet was Harry Brooks, a good-looking, ebullient radio man and waste gunner from Michigan. The co-pilot would be George Mazarat Jr., because co-pilots were rotated from plane to plane as they qualified to be pilots. Mazarat would stay with the crew, but he would become fast friends with Phil and Louie. Mazarat wouldn't stay with the crew, but he would become fast friends. Mazda, Mitchell, Phil, and Louis were officers. The other were enlisted. All were bachelors, but Harry Brooks, like Phil, had a steady girl back home. Her name was Jeanette, and before the war, war she and Harry had set their wedding date for May 8, 1943. The men were issued heavy sheepskin jackets and wool clothing, assembled and photographed. They would make up crew number eight in the ninth crew, 372nd Bomb Squadron of the 307th Bomb Group, 7th Air Force. All they needed was a plane. Louis was hoping to be assigned to a B-17 flying fortress. It was the kind of plane that men, want, men wanted to be seen in. Handsome, masculine, nimble, fairly assembled, reliable, long-winded, and practically indestructible. The plane that no one wanted was a new bomber, Consolidated Aircraft B-24 Liberator. On paper, it was generally comparable to the B-17, but for one major advantage, thanks to auxiliary fuel tanks and slender, ultra-efficient Davis wings, it could fly literally a day a decisive asset in the sprawling World War II theater. Flat-faced, rectangular, and brooding, the B-24 had books only a myopic mother could love. Crewmen gave it a host of nicknames, among them the Flying Brick, the Flying Boxcar, and the Constipated Lumberer, a play on consolidated, 
console dated liberator. The cockpit was oppressively cramped, forcing pilot and co-pilot to live check by jowl for missions as long as 16 hours. Cranning over the mountainous control panel, the pilot had panoramic view of the plane's snout and not much else. Navigating the nine inch wide bomb bay catwalk could be difficult, especially in turbulence. One slip and you tumble into the bay, which was fitted with fragile aluminum doors that would tear away the weight of a falling man. Taxing was an adventure. The B-24's wheel had no steering, so the pilot had to cajole the bomber along by feeding power to one side's engine, then the other and working back and forth on the left and right brakes, one of which was usually more sensitive than the other. This made the taxiway a pageant of lurching planes, all of which sooner or later ended up veering into places nowhere near where their pilots intended them to go and from which they often had to be extricated with shovels. Pilot Byron Kinney once wrote that the first time he got into a B-24 cockpit, it was like sitting on the front porch and flying the house. The sentiment was common. The Liberator was one of the heaviest planes in the world. The D model, then in production, weighed 71,000 pounds loaded. Flying was like wrestling a bear, leaving pilots wary and sore. Because pilots usually man the yoke with their left hands, while their right hands work the other controls, B-24 pilots were inst instantly recognizable when shirtless because of the muscles on their left arms dwarf those of their right arms. The plane was so clumsy that it was so difficult that it was difficult to fly in the tight formations that were critical to fending off attack. A squigglish of turbulence or a crewman walking inside the fuselage would trip the plane off its axis. The B-24 was plagued with mechanical difficulties. It was one of the four engines quick, staying airborne was challenging. The failure of two engines was often an emergency. Shortly after the plane was introduced, there were several incidents in which B-24 tails dropped off in midair, and though the war was young, the plane was winning a reputation for being delicate, especially in the skinny wings, which could snap off in combat. Some of the men at Ephrata thought of the B-24 as a death trap. After a long wait, the 372nd Squadron planes flew into Ephraim, Ephrata. Those crew walked out and squinted on the horizon. Even from a distance, there was no, no mistake in the silhouettes. As the men grumbled, Louis heard one voice pipe up. It's the flying coffin. They were assigned to a B-24D that looked like all the others. For the next three months in Ephrata in August and September and Sioux City in October, they practically lived in it. They flew in formation, fired at targets, pulled by tow planes, simulated combat runs, and dive bomb. One day, they buzzed so low over Iowa that the propellers kicked up a storm of sand skinning the paint off the plate's belly and scouring the leg of Pillsbury, who was sitting by the open hatch in the tail, trying to photograph the dummy boots as they fell into target nets. Throughout it all, Louis perched in the glass-windowed greenhouse in the plane's nose, bombing targets. The COs soon learned the squadron's proudness. Angry farmers came calling after the 372nd's 100-pound bombs flattened an outhouse and one unfortunate cow. Phil's crew had their first scare at Ephrata. On a training flight, they had tr radio trouble and got lost, flew around in blind confusion for hours and ended up landing at nearly midnight in Spokane, half a state, half a state away from their slated destination. They'd been missing for three and a half hours and their entire West Coast Air Corps had been hunting for them. When Phil stepped off the plane, he got one chew chewing out from a colonel when he flew back at Frada, he got in another in stereo from a colonel and major. I grew a little older that night, sweet, believe me, he wrote to Cece. The panic had been justified, for accidents were common and deadly. Before Louis had begun his bombarder training, he had received a letter from a friend who was in an Air Corps cadet. I guess you read about the cadet and instructor who was killed here last week. The poor devils never had a chance. They stalled their ship while turning from base leg onto the landing approach. The ship made a one-turn spin and then really hit the ground. When they hit it, tore their bones to pieces. The safety belt cut the instructor half in two. All over the wrecked part of the airplane, it looked like somebody took and threw about three pans of tomatoes and cracked all over it, blood and flesh. They were mangled to bits, couldn't even identify them by looking at them. It was the kind of story that was filling the letters of would-be airmen all over the country. Pilot and navigator air, mechanical failure, and bad luck were killing trainees at stunning rate. In the Army Air Forces, or AAF, there were 52,651 stateside aircraft accidents over the course of the war, killing 14,903 personnel. Though some of those personnel were probably on coastal patrol and other duties, it can be presumed that the vast majority were trainees killed without ever seeing a combat theater. 
In the three months in which Phil's men trained as a crew, 3,041 AAF planes, more than 33 per day, met with accidents stateside. That's a lot of planes going down every day just for training. Killing nine men per day. In subsequent months, death tallies exceeded 500 were common. In August 1943, 590 airmen would die stateside, 19 per day. So 19 Americans are dying every day just training to use this aircraft that they're going to fight in war. Louis, Phil, and their crew saw the dying firsthand. In July, Phil's close friend had been killed in a B-24 just after Phil had been dining with him. One On another day, Phil's crew spent part of a rainy morning sitting in a briefing room with another guy as crew as they awaited flights. Both crews went to their planes, but at the last minute, Phil's crew was ordered back. The other crew took off, flew two miles and crashed, killing the pilot and navigator. In October, in Sioux City, another bomber from their group plowed onto a field, killing two. When he learned the press was reporting on the crash without giving the crewmen's names, Phil ran out of a meeting to get word to his family that he hadn't been on the plane. The Air Corps did its best to teach men how to survive a crash. Men were drilled in preparing their planes for impact and equipping themselves for post-crash survival. Each man was assigned to a crash station, which in Louis's case was by a, the waste window behind the right wing. They were also schooled in bailout situations, jumping from parked planes. Some rolled off the catwalk and tried through the open bomb bay doors. Others leapt from the waste windows, wondering how, if jumping from an airborne plane, they'd avoid being cut in two by the twin rudders just behind the windows. They were also taught how to ditch or make a controlled landing on water. Phil studied dutifully, but he found the idea of landing a giant bomber on water kind of silly. The training film surely deepened his doubts. In every film, the ditching B-24 broke apart. Training was a crucible and it transformed Phil. Crew. They would not all live through what lay ahead, but the survivors would speak of their good fortune in serving among such skilled men. They worked together with seamless efficiency, and judging by their training scores and the grim business of bombs and bullets, there was no better crew in the squadron. Among surviving crewmen and men from other crews, the warmest praise would be reserved for Phil. B-24s were built for tall pilots, and though, though Phil needed a cushion to get his feet to the pedals and his eyes over the control panel, by all accounts, he was superb at his job. Phil, Louis told a reporter, was a damn swell pilot. The B-24 assigned to Phil's crew had its own personality. It had a valve that oozed fuel into the bomb bay, prompting Pillsbury to develop a nervous habit of pacing the fuselage, sniffing the air. It, a, it had a carbon drogonry fuel transfer valve that Pillsbury and Douglas had to finesse into place, lest it stick wide open, slow an engine, or trigger a deafening backfire. The fuel gauges were reliable only until the tanks neared empty, at which point they sometimes reported that the plane was magically gaining fuel. One engine, for reasons known only to the only to the plane, was thirstier than the other, so the gauges had to be watched constantly. In time, the men's misgivings about the Liberator fell away. In hundreds of hours of intense training, their plane never failed them. For all its ugliness and quirks, it was a noble thing. Rugged and inexhaustible, the ground crewmen felt the same, nursing Phil's plane with affection and fretting while it flew. When it returned, they received it with relief, scolding the crew for any scratches. Airmen talked of flying boxcars, but Phil and Louis dismissed them. Louis described it as our home. On the ground, the crew drank together, swam in the local lakes, and cruised around Afrata and Sioux City. In the latter, Louis discovered that the enlisted ground cruisemen, crewmen, who had preceded them into town had convinced the local women that their insignia indicated that they were officers. As Louis set off to right this wrong, Phil pulled night duty at the operations office. Someone one night he drifted into a troubled dream. In it he came home from the war only to find that Cece had given him up. On a Saturday afternoon in mid-October 1942, the men of the 372nd were told to pack their bags. Their training was being cut short and they were being sent to California's Hamilton Field then rushed overseas. Phil was crestfallen. Ceci was about to come see him. He would miss her by three days. On October the 20th, the squadron flew out of Iowa. At Hamilton Field, an artist was working his way down the planes, painting each one's name and accompanying it in an illustration. Naming bombers was a grand tradition. Many B-24 crews dreamed of delightful, clever names. Among them, E. Pluribus Aluminum, Access Grinder, The Bad Penny, and Bombs Nip On. 
Quite a few of the rest were shamelessly bawdy, painted with scantily clad and unclad women. One featured a sailor chasing a nascent naked girl around the fuselage. Its name was Willie Maker. Louis had a snapshot taken of himself grinning under one of the more rabid examples. <clears throat> Phil's plane needed a name, but no one could think of one. After the war, the survivors would have difficult memories of who named the plane, but in a letter penned that fall, Billy would write that it was co-pilot George Mosnet who suggested Superman. Everyone liked it, and the name was painted on the plane's nose, along with the superhero himself. A bomb in one hand and a machine gun in the other. Louis didn't think much of the painting. In photographs, the gun looks like a shovel, but Phil loved it. Most crews referred to their planes as she. Phil insisted that his plane was all man. The men were slated for combat, but they hadn't been told what they would, where they would serve. Judging by the heavy winter, winter gear, Louis thought that they were bombed for Alaska's Aleutian Islands, which had been invaded by the Japanese months before. He was happily wrong. They were going to Hawaii. On the evening of October 24th, Louis called home for a last goodbye. He just missed Pete, who came for a visit only a few minutes after his brother hung up. Sometime after speaking to Louis, Louise pulled out a set note of cards in which she kept lists of Christmas card recipients. After Louis's last visit home, she had taken out one of the cards and on it, jotted the name and a few words about Louis's departure. That day, she noted Louis's phone call. These were the first two entries in what she would become Louis's war diary. A pair of airmen's wings. Every morning through all that day lay ahead for her. Louis would pin the wings to her dress. Every night before she went to Louise would pin the wings to her dress. Every night before she went to bed, she'd take them off her dress and pin them to her nightgown. On November 2nd, 1942, Phil's crew climbed aboard Superman and ready to go to war. They were heading into a desperate fight north to south. Japan's new empire stretched 5,000 miles from snowbound Aleutians to Java. Hundreds of miles south of the equator, west to east, the empire sprawled over more than 6,000 miles, from the border of India to the Gilbert and Marshall Islands in the Central Pacific. In the Pacific, virtually everything above Australia and west of the international daylight had been taken by Japan. Only a few eastward in inland islands had been spared, among them the Hawaiian Islands. Midway, Canton, Fernardi, and a tiny paradise called Palmyra. It was from these outposts that the men of the AAF were trying to win the Pacific. As the saying went, one damned island after another. That day, Superman banked over the Pacific for the first time. The crew was bound for Oahu's Hickam Field. When the war had begun for America 11 months before, and where would soon begin for them? The rim of California slid away, and then there was nothing but ocean. From this day forward, until victory or defeat, transfer, discharge, capture, or death took them from it, the vast Pacific would be beneath and all around them. And the bottom was already littered with downed war planes and the ghost of lost airmen. Every day of this long and ferocious war would join them. So, they're not looking forward to fighting in Europe. They're looking forward to fighting in the vast Pacific. This was, that was um, chapter six of uh, Laura Heldon Brooks' book, Unbroken. My name is Gregory Brand. Hit the thumbs up and subscribe and, you know, send us a song. All right. And keep reading.